Hey, hey, Blue Table fans. James and Brett on the other side of the camera here with another intro game. All right, what are we doing today, James? Today we're talking about War Machine. War um, Machine. War Machine's an awesome game. It's made by Privateer Press. They make War Machine and Hordes. They're both kind of interchangeable games, so it doesn't matter if you pick a Hordes or a War Machine faction. They can battle it out on the tabletop against each other and have fun doing it. And War Machine is a, kind of a skirmish-based game, but they're growing. They're getting bigger models. they got the new Colossals book that just came out the 11th of this month. Extremely impressive models. They've got some awesome figs on the tabletop, and we're going to show you a few right here. All right, so for our demonstration game here, we're going to do uh, both of our personal armies. So over okay. here we have uh, James's Rulik Mercenaries. And then over here I have my Pirate Mercenaries. And um, so these are both things that we've purchased and painted ourselves. Yep. And uh, these, each of these equate to 15 points um, army size. And that's pretty much the small size you're gonna get. Yeah, 15 points is really like the bare minimum to get a game going. But when you buy a starter box, which they've got all new plastic starter boxes for all the Horde stuff that's just come out, um, the, all the War Machine models, most of the factions already have a starter box except for the mercenaries. Brett and I both went kind of the hard way and had to build them from scratch. But all those are running around right around 15 points each. So pretty much out of the box, you're ready to rock and roll, ready to play a game, and enjoy yourself. Awesome. All right, James. Um, tell me what makes uh, War Machine different than any of the other tabletop miniature games out there. Um, well, one of the things that they use is a card system. Okay. All of the special rules for each model is on the card. It's got front and back. Each model has special abilities, and we're going to go over these here for you shortly. Um, and it's got, they've got wound boxes and different things that you use to keep track of. It is a my turn, your turn sort of game. It's, it's uh, different than some of the games that we've done recently where they have a, a, a reaction type system. Um, so it is pretty much kind of move and, and go. But you do only activate one unit at a time. It has to do all of its actions. So it'll move shoot, assault, do that sort of thing, and then you move on to the next unit. Now, a unit can be either a single model, being a Warcaster or a solo model, or even a Warjack, they call them, which are these awesome steampunk models, or it can be a unit of models. In Brett's case over here, he has the Commodore, which is a cannon in three models, and that is actually an entire unit. And that'll all go together. There's front and rear arc, which are important in the game because it can affect shooting, armor, all kinds of good things. So, basically, right. let's go over the kind of the uh, the turn sequence of the game and kind of get you interested. Okay. Brett, what do you got for me? Hey, guys. All right, so we're going to talk about turn sequence. And um, I have here is the War Machine Prime rulebook. This is essential for playing War Machine. Everything you need is in there. Um, and one term you need to know off the to begin with is what's something called focus. Focus is something that a caster has that he can give to different models in his in his battle group. And those models can then do specific actions using that focus. And you only have a limited amount of focus. And that's important because there's in, during the different phases you can use your focus at different times. So the first phase is what's known as the maintenance phase. The maintenance phase is where you um, take care of any residual effects from the previous turn, uh, remove any um, excess focus that was unused, and generally kind of clean up from the last turn. The next phase is called the control phase. This is where your caster can allocate focus to Warjacks in his control group. Essentially, that gives them focus that they can then use during their activation to make additional attacks or to charge or to do other special abilities. Um, that's pretty much the only thing you do during the control phase. The third phase is what's known as the activation phase. And this is where you start activating the individual models. Um, and any focus left on a caster during this time can be used for spells. Um, and then your warjacks can then use their focus to charge, make additional attacks, or to boost their attacks. And um, so it's pretty simple. Those are the three phases. Uh, it goes pretty quickly. And um, yeah, so we're going to kind of go through some demonstrations on how to do each of those phases. Okay, now one thing is to note before we, we cut off this and go on to the next part is Hordes has just a little bit different system. Yeah. What do they use? So they have Fury. And it kind of, as far as I understand, it kind of works opposite of focus. And uh, so for right now, we're just going to concentrate on, on War Machine and focus. And eventually later, we will do a hordes, a special hordes um, video and, and explain how Fury works. Because it can be a little confusing. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Brett. Thank you. Hey, Brett. 
Back here, what I've done is I've kind of set up my guys here in the normal deployment zone, which is nine inches. So I've got my BTP trusty tape measure, which yes, you too can own. <laughs> Buy today, limited quantities available. Okay, so I've got nine inches out. Now there are some special rules, certain uh, units, give you special abilities you can move during basically before the game even starts or you have a further deployment zone. We're not going to worry about that right now. We're just going to kind of go through the, the, the starting steps here. So obviously the first thing is maintenance phase. The very first turn of the game, there's nothing going on during the maintenance phase. So I have nothing to do there. So the next phase is control, control phase. So in this case, I look at Gorton on his card here. Let's show you here. We got Gordon Grunbeck. Got all of his stats up here. So this is your warcaster. He's kind of the leader of the group. Correct. Every army has to have a warcaster. Okay. My guys are dwarves, so they're slow. That's their speed four. His strength and mat are seven for strength. Mat is melee attack rating, ranged attack rating, defense thirteen, armor nineteen, command is eight, and then he's got a dual hand cannon, forge father, which is an awesome weapon, and the gutter. In this case, he has five focus. So this is what we need to concentrate on right now. He has five focus available. So in this case, I have three jacks that I'm running. So what I would do is I would put one on each jack and leave two on Gorton. Now you notice these awesome tokens here I got? These are actually from Privateer Press. You can buy tokens to match any of your factions. They've got them for hordes and War Machine. And I highly recommend them because it makes the life a lot easier when you're playing the game. All right, so that's control phase. So the next would be activation. So I would say, okay, in this case here, I'm gonna take my basher, which is one of my war jacks. And again, we've got his speed, which is five, and his stats there. And you notice he doesn't have any ranged attack. All he is is a, a melee beast. And I'll say, okay, well, he's gonna run. So I have to use the focus in order to do that. And running allow lets him move double. double his movement. So in this case, he would move 10 inches. So he would move all the way up there. Which is super fast for a dwarf. <laughs> yes. And so, Warjacks can only run or charge if they have focus on it. Correct. Now, had I put a second focus on him, for example, and there was a model here, because I ran, I couldn't charge. He would, he'd be out of range, I wouldn't be able to do anything else. It because would be a wasted focus. Because a charge movement is your speed plus three. Correct. So, that would basically end his turn. He wouldn't be able to do anything else. He ran, so he wouldn't be able to shoot or do anything, and, and he doesn't have a shooting so attack So that takes anyway. up his whole activation. So that's his entire activation. Next, let's run with the, the Avalancher here. It's one of my favorites. Speed four, so he's, only, he's got a really slow move, but he's also got a shield here. This assault shield actually gives him plus two to his armor. So instead of being 19, it's actually 21. So he's really hard to damage. You might be able to hit him, but you're not gonna damage him or do a lot of damage to him in one turn. And if you look at his damage grid, he's got a lot of damage boxes. Each one of those boxes is one hit point. So he, he can nice. take a beating and keep on going. And he's got this awesome gun, with a, which is range 15. So he's gonna move up. He would move up, in this case, four inches. Now, if there was an enemy in sight, I could shoot if I would like and I would make my attack roll and go from there then I could use my focus during that to either boost the attack which normal attack is 2d6 plus in this case would be a ranged attack so it'd be 2d6 plus his rat which the avalancher back over here is only five and you're going against your opponent's defense rating so in this case let's go ahead and just roll it out just for fun so I've got seven plus my rat of five. Not very good. So depending on the, the so defense. That's a 12. So it, if he was fighting a model that had defense 14, for example, that wouldn't have hit. That wouldn't have hit. But if it was an, a model with defense 14, I would have used my focus to boost it. And that is adding a third die to the roll, which would then, which would then, hit. then have hit. However, if it's a low defense, high armor model like mine, let's say I was shooting at another model similar to my own, I would not use the focus to roll the hit. I'd roll the hit. In that case, it would be a 10. My defense is nine, so I would hit an identical model of mine. Take the focus, use the focus to boost the damage roll to make sure that I get past the armor. And so now the damage roll is normally 2d6 plus. 2d6 plus the power rating of whatever it is. If it's a ranged attack, it's power 14 in this case. All right. If it's a melee attack, he's power plus strength, which is 
the total there is 14 as well. So it's pretty easy, pretty pretty awesome. All right, so if you were to, if you were to add 14 to your roll, right? Yeah. So in this case, I've got 26. So 14 plus 4, 18, 21, 26. In this case, he's got armor 21, so I would have done five points of damage to a, an identical avalancher. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's a question, James. What if you have two focus on your warjack? Can you boost both your attack and your damage? You can do that. Or the other thing that I like to do personally is not use that second focus to boost both rolls unless I absolutely need it, but use that second focus to do another attack. And now certain weapons, um, for example, like his Avalanche's cannon, it'll say on here, rate of fire one, which means you can only fire it ever once. Right, however, there are some times where you can make a second attack if it has multiple rate of fire. Some cases have two, three, or even more, but you have to use a focus in order to get those. Yes. So I could use my focus, in this case, I could shoot something and do a melee attack, or you could use the focus to do a second melee attack, which nice. is awesome. So in that case, I would have done six damage to an avalancher. So then what you do, if you look here, there's numbers at the top of each damage grid. What you do is you roll a d6 to find out where that six points of damage goes. In this case, it starts at six. So you take a dry erase marker, and it is a good idea to either get these baseball card sleeves, the full sheet like this, or just some kind of card sleeve that is uh, clear on both sides so that you can mark on them and erase it later. So starting so, from the six, you're doing five points of damage? So we'll do one, two, three, four. Uh-oh, now what happens? Any idea, Brett? I'm gonna say you start over at one now. Yep, it just carries over to the next number. So four, five, six. So in this case, it's got some little letters down here. Each one of those stand for something. I've got four systems. Left arm, right arm, L and R. M is movement, and C is my cortex. Now, if any one of those are destroyed, then it's gonna affect its combat ability. If the cortex is destroyed, it means that I can no longer allocate focus to the jack. If its movement is destroyed, he's basically dead in the water. Um, left arm, right arm, obviously shield would then be destroyed, so then I wouldn't be able to use the shield bonus. The right arm, if the right arm gets destroyed, then I wouldn't be able to use the cannon. So, in that case, I just did some damage to myself. Then I would take my driller over here, and I'd probably run him as well. In this case, he's only got a movement of four, so he's only moving eight. And that would use up his focus. Then last but not least, I have Gorton over here, and he's got two focus on him. Now I can choose to leave the focus on him for an armor benefit during my opponent's turn, or I can use that two focus to cast a spell. So what I'll do is I'll go over here to my spells, and one thing that I like to run with is solid ground. It costs me two, the range is myself, AOE is control area, so I look, well, there's nowhere for control area over here. What's control area, Brett? Control area is double your focus. Oh, okay. So we have command area, and we have a control area based on focus. So in this case, he's got a control area of 10 inches. So the spray template here is 10 inches, so that gives me an easy idea to know that my basher is outside of my control area. So I can still move him and cast a spell, so I'm gonna have to move him up his four inches to make sure that everybody is in range. Then he's gonna go ahead and cast that spell. Now how do we go about casting spells? Do we, do we have to roll anything? How does that work? Well, it depends. Um, if it's a, like a, a spell that you cast on yourself or a friendly model, mm -hmm. uh, the spell auto-casts, basically. It's, it's, okay. it's done. However, if you're casting an offensive spell against an enemy model, then you do have to roll. Right. Basically, then you're, you're rolling like a ranged attack rating, something like that, is that right? Yep. Awesome. So he moved up, he cast that. Now what's really cool about solid ground is, while in this model's control area, friendly models cannot be knocked down and do not suffer blast damage. So I'm facing against an opponent, in this case, the Commodore over there, his big cannon, it does what? It blasts. So now my guys are immune to that extra damage. So basically I've got a little leg up to start off the game. So at that point, or so he thinks. Hey now. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, my turn is done, and I would turn it over to Brett. All righty. All right, my turn now. So we're going to demonstrate some um, actual combat things going on here. So we're going to show you charging, running, or not sorry, charging, shooting, and some area effect stuff. So we've we've passed a few turns here, so to say, and um, my guys are all set up. I've got my guys set up good for a good attack here. 
So I'm going to show you a different way of keeping track of focus. For those of you who don't have templates, um, I, I like to use a D6. It's easy for my guy. He has six okay. focus. I have six right here. So I kind of start out like that. Oh, you're hiding over yeah, there. Yeah, sorry. My caster's hiding you. back here. Um, and the nice thing about like allocating focus and that kind of stuff is you don't have to have line of sight. Just as long as you're within your control area, you're good. Awesome. His control area is twice his focus. His focus is six. So his okay. control area is 12. So wow. this jack and this jack are both within my control area, so I can allocate them focus. Awesome. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to allocate two focus to him. So I put a little two there, and that puts me down to four on that one. Okay. I'm going to then um, allocate two focus on to this one, which puts my caster's focus down to two. Okay, now notice you didn't have to have a line of sight to do that. Is that correct? Yeah, it's correct. Allocating focus, just as long as it's in the control area, no line of sight. Awesome. Um, so yeah. So that would be, uh, so I, I would have done my maintenance phase, that was my control phase, and now I'm going to go into my activation phase. And now, I should point out that um, your strategy can depend on which model you activate first. There's no real order, like you have to do your caster, then your jacks, then your solos, then your units, it doesn't matter. But it could matter in just in terms of your strategy, right. when you do certain things. And in a lot of cases, just uh, FYI, it's usually better to save your caster till last. Yes. <laughs> Not kind of always. See what so. happens and kind of play it by ear. Yep. All right, so my first activation, I'm going to activate Bosun Grogspar here. And I want him to charge his driller. However, terrain comes into effect here. Anything, any terrain feature that is taller than an inch, you can't move over without penalties. Okay. So, technically, even though he's within my charge range, um, I can't charge him because this, if I were to draw a straight line to him, this would be well over an inch. Oh, heck Because, yeah. sorry, that's the inch side there. Yeah. <laughs> so, in order for me to get up next to him, I'd have to move up to this point, like this, move up here, and do that. Okay. I can't charge him. I could still shoot him if I wanted to because he has a ranged attack and I'm out. I am not in melee. Melee mm -hmm. is in half an inch of the enemy model. But I can't move any further than that. Okay, so the charge has to be in a straight line then? charge has to be in a straight line. Awesome. Yes. Um, there are certain models like uh, that'll have a special ability called Pathfinder, which lets them do different things in their charge. But for this purpose, that's all he can do. So, I'm going to move on to the next model. Okay. And I'm going to activate the Freebooter. And he is going to charge his Basher. Now, he has free line. Yep. yep. Nothing um, blocking him. His movement is normally five, but on the charge you get your movement plus three, which puts him total at eight. So I got to make sure he's within range of my charge, and he's well within range. Okay. So he's gonna make the charge. <laughs> now, when you make a charge attack like this, you get some bonuses to when you attack, and it's very helpful. So I'm gonna show you how to do a normal melee attack. And if we look at the card on the on the freebooter you'll see that he has two weapons, two hand weapons, a clamp in the left arm and a clamp in the right arm. That means he gets to make two attacks. So, awesome. we're gonna do the first attack. Okay, so did he have to use one of these focus to do a charge? He sure did. Awesome. Thank you. So that leaves him at one focus. So what I'm gonna do, he's going to attack, and on a charge, you get an extra die on your first attack. So, okay. normally, 2d6. But In because it's a case, charge. 3d6. So, James, awesome. what is the defense on the Basher? Be the Basher only has a defense of 10. Defense of 10. So he's got relatively low defense. My rat, or sorry, my net. Yep. Melee um, attack rating. Melee attack rating is 6. Okay. So, in order to defeat his defense of 10, I have to roll at least a 4 or higher with my 3d6. Should be pretty easy. Should be pretty easy. Unless I roll 3 ones. This yep. is going to hit, so here yeah, we go. And if anybody's ever watched any of our bat reps, knows it can happen. It can happen. <laughs> Especially with me. All right. Easily. So I got 10. So I beat him. I beat his defense. So okay. that means my, my attack hits. Now right. we're going to see if it does damage. So James, okay. what is your armor? The armor on the bat, or the, yeah, the basher is 19. 19. Now see, the Rulik stuff has low defense, but high armor. And it's really annoying. So, what I'm going to look at to counteract his armor is I'm going to look at the strength of the weapon. In this case, it's 14. Okay. So, in order for my 14 to beat his 19, I have to roll higher than a 5. If you right. equal it, it doesn't do anything. You have to roll higher. So, I have to roll a 6 or higher. Okay. And I get 2d6. Awesome. All right. So, go. I got a 4 and a 4. Okay. Awesome. So, I get an 8. So, I, that means I get 2 points of damage past his armor. 
Correct. So now where what I do is I roll again on one d six, and that damage is going to the four column. Okay. So in this case, what I'll do is I come over here. One, and two. Sorry, I am not left-handed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that was that was attack with his right arm. So now he's going to do attack with his left arm. Now I already used the charge bonus, so I can't use it again. So I'm just rolling two d six. Okay. But it's a pretty sure bet that I'm going to get past his defense ten. Right. So here we go. Oh yeah, just on the one die. Sail pass. That's awesome. So now I'm going to roll my damage again. Okay. Now, I'm going to use my last focus and boost my damage. So I'm going to roll three d six. Awesome. And I'm doing that because I really want to get some damage past him. And right. I want to I want to bring him down. So here we go. And look at that. I rolled Five, this Five, six, seven, eight. So what does that do? So that gets a whopping two points of damage past him. All right. Now where does that? Now I roll again. My d6. That's going on the, the two. two column. Okay. So then we're going to put two over here. One and two. All right. So I only got to do four points of damage on him. And so in a charge, you know, it, it helps you. I, I needed the boost. I needed to make sure I could do, hit him and get some damage. Um, so now I'm going to move to my next model. Okay. And there are special rules that we're not going to go over right now that dictate, like, if you land both attacks, sometimes you get, like, a special move afterwards, which he does, but we're not going to go into that just yet. Just kind of showing you the basics of combat. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to use this guy. This guy's called the Mariner. And he's going to take a shot with his cannon at his avalanche. Awesome. So he's not going to move, so that he gets an aiming bonus because of that. And okay, and what's an aiming bonus? Do? An aiming bonus helps essentially buff his uh, his ability to shoot at a target. Awesome. So it's going to increase my rat by two. Ooh, nice. Normally, his rat is five, so that puts his rat to seven. So James, what is your defense? Defense on the avalanche here is nine. All right. So my rat's seven, his defense is nine, so I need at least a two to land the hit. So this is a pretty good bet that I'm going to land the hit. Right. So here we go. There you go. There we go. Definitely, Easy enough. Definitely hit. So now I have to try and get past his armor. And if you remember from earlier, his armor is 21. That yep. is insanely high. <laughs> because my, my power on his weapon is only 14. Ouch. So yeah, this is, this is going to be hard. So I'm going to use one of my focus, and I'm going to boost the damage roll. So I'm rolling three okay. d six. All right. So I got eleven. Okay. So that puts me at twenty five. Okay. So I get four damage past his armor. Yep. So that's going to go to the three. Awesome. I'm going to mark that down here. We go over here to one, two, two damage. Three damage. Three damage. Okay. All right, I'm going to show you a little area of effect blast here. If you remember my, my Commodore cannon here? This thing is a lot of fun. It has three different types of weapons. No, it's or, not. Sorry, three different types <laughs> of uh, ammunition. Um, in this case, we're going to use incendiary shot. So it basically shoots out a thing that explodes and sends fire everywhere. Um, it is a, a three-inch area of effect. So we got my nice little three-inch blast template here. Yep. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to center it on him. Okay? So that's my, my aiming point. So I still have to roll my rat against his defense yep. in order to see if the shot hits a direct target or if it has to deviate. Okay. If I pass my rat, it hits directly. Correct. If I miss, I have to roll for deviation. Okay. So in this case, let's go ahead and just assume that it's going to miss. Okay. And just to kind of show, how do, you, how do you figure out deviation? All right. So essentially what you do, um, and we have a, normally we have a different tempo that's easier. Hang on but, one second, let's yeah, grab that. Yeah, let's see if we can find it. So here we are back. This is the official one. This is actually a Horde, so they do make one for War Machine. And you'll notice that it has these little arrows on it here with numbers. You're starting with the target from the direction of the attacker. You kind of basically draw a straight line to the target. All right, so what I do, so let's, we're going to say that I miss. So now I roll for deviation. 1d6. Four. four. So it's going to deviate in this direction. Straight back. How many inches? I roll again. Six inches. Six inches. So nice. it would move back six inches, which wouldn't do anything. So we're going to move it here. So that's going to be right there. So it doesn't get anybody. No. Nope. Bummer. However, let's just say that I had hit. Correct. You notice three inch blast radius here. So it would have only hit the model underneath it. Yep. Let's say it deviated though, like an inch and a half or two inches this way. Right. 
any base underneath the three inch blast would have been hit. Yep. So both the basher and the, the air well, would have been Even hit. if it had deviated far enough to go over here and actually hit his own model. Yep, it still would have, it could have hit mine. It could have done yep. damage to mine. Um, a direct hit does full damage. Um, a deep, like a peripheral hit, I don't know what else you'd call it. Um, a non-direct hit uh, does half damage, I believe. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, so there we go. Awesome. Anything else for your turn? You still um, got your caster back there with two focus. still got my focus. caster back there with two focus. Maybe he'll cast a spell. Let's see what would be a good spell to cast with him. He's got some fun little annoying spells. He's going to cast Phantasm. And he's going to cast it on the Mariner here. Okay, now what does Phantasm do? Phantasm, the phone. Basically, it makes this model so that if, if you try to shoot him with your Avalancher, your Avalancher normally has a 15 inch range, now he has a 10 inch range. Okay. So it makes it, it, it basically makes any range attack against my, this model at minus five to range. Awesome. That's right, and that takes two of my focus, so I'll do that. Now, one thing that we, we didn't mention here, and one of the reasons why he actually shot over here my Avalancher. Even though I got Gorton, he's sit seemingly sitting out here in the open. He can't shoot through that model because this is a larger base here. It's the same base size as what he has, and Gorton is a smaller base size. Now, what's interesting to note, Fla or Flames of War, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Completely wrong game. Don't know where that came from. In War Machine and Hordes, each model has a height designated by its base size. Now, what's really cool is if you actually get the the official templates here, it shows you, ooh, that's hard with the, the glare on there, I'm trying to get it so you can see. Okay, you can see the first mark there is for a small base. So if you have anybody on a small base, that's how tall they are. A medium base and a large base. And obviously with the new Colossals, they have their own height that isn't on here yet. Which is six inches, actually. Yeah, it's six inches. So that's, that's insane. That's actually up to there. Yeah. So, so interesting, interesting to note, um, other games use a true line of sight to the model. Right. This uses true line of sight to the model's height and volume. Right. So even if technically you couldn't see the model, but the base, you can actually see a portion of the base, then for all accounts and purposes, you can actually see the model. Right. Um, the way they, they do targeting in this game is this isn't actually a model per se. This is a can. It's, it's got a certain height and a certain width, and it takes up all of that space at all times. Now, let's say that his Mariner was a larger base size than my basher, a medium base size, and he was a smaller base size. Chances are he wouldn't be able to see him. And in the book, it kind of explains, kind of gives you the, a visual of what it looks like. Even though the model itself exceeds the volume of the base, it still only has that much volume. Yeah. So that's important to note because it can actually, you know, if you, like for example, it shows, it shows the uh, behemoth here sticking above the volume. So technically, in, in true line of sight, you could see the guy's little ammunition things up here. The volume is what's determining your line of sight. So you wouldn't technically have line of sight to that model. Awesome. Well, let's set up another couple of scenarios here and see what happens. Alrighty. So now we're going to do some special things here. So that was kind of all the basics of combat, basics of gameplay. Now James is going to demonstrate a few special rules. And, and every faction is going to be different. Every um, caster, every, every caster. model is going to be different. Yeah. But these are just some general ones that you'll probably run across in average gameplay. Yep. Well, Gordon Grunbeck here, he's got what's called a feat. Every war caster has a special Actually, he has power. two feet. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just being an idiot. Lame. <laughs> All right. So he has a feat, F-E-A-T, not to be confused with F-E-E-T, these things. <laughs> that he can do, just like every other Warcaster in the game, be it Hordes or War Machine. Now his is called Landslide. Effectively what he does is he pushes models in his control area a direction of his choosing. So the very first thing I do, it says I choose a table edge and a distance up to eight inches. All right. So in this case, I'm gonna choose the, op the opposite table edge. Okay. And my distance in this case, I'm gonna say five inches. All right. Okay, actually, no, I'm gonna say four inches. We're gonna keep it, we're gonna keep it simple here. We're gonna go only four inches, so I don't have to go the maximum. So then what happens is anyone in his control area, that 10 inch range that we talked about earlier. Which is, your control area is double your focus. Right, so the, that only happens to enemy models. Okay, so this guy and Grogspar here are gonna be pushed back four inches. 
So in this case, he'll be pushed back to there. Now this, because it's less than one inch, isn't gonna affect him in any way, shape, or form. Had he been over here, and I pushed him off the edge, he would actually fall down, which is great because then it lowers their defense. And it makes gives it, it requires them to take an action to stand up. Well, yeah, that too. And it could do damage. Exactly. All right, so James, how many times in a game can you do can you use your feet? One time. That's so it's it. It's just a one off. It's, it's a one use only, either a last ditch effort to push your enemy away so you can kind of regroup a little bit. Or in his case, I've used it quite often to actually pull the enemy in closer so I can do more damage. All right, so James, how come in this, why is it that in this instance you're pushing me away? Well, because I want to set myself up for a couple of charges. I want to do some special things with my charge. My basher here is going to be able to charge him. And now my driller is going to be able to, is going to, be able to charge over there. And yes, that's what it's like every day. Sean is an awesome boss. He's <laughs> he's hilarious to work with. So those other people not working on Saturday. Yeah. Who do they think they are? <laughs> it's Saturday work for you people. Yeah, Brett. Yeah, I need you to come in yeah. Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> All right, getting do back we really to reality. Do you really have to go come in Saturday? <laughs> you do. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. He popped his feet. So effectively what I've done in this case, like we were talking about earlier, your play, your activation really changes on how you want things to pan out. And in this case, I've activated him first. So what I should have done is put on some focus here. Well, we will assume that you have done yeah. that. Yeah. We're kind of skipping around here, so it's really messing up kind of my, my groove with my, my dwarves here. So in this case, I'm gonna put two focus on him one focus over here so I can charge with him. I'm going to leave two focus on Gordon. And just in case anybody's wondering, um, James is really a dwarf in disguise. And um, I wear stilts. This is my normal height. Pretty much in every <laughs> game he plays, he, check, he picks dwarfs for the most part. Elves so. are pansy, okay? I just I don't like elves. And I know my friend from high school will never ever see this. We're still friends on Facebook, but uh, he always played elves, I always played dwarves, and we always had this hate hate relationship in every game we ever played. Yeah, so. but he's a. Uh, James is a little frightened of the retribution list I'm going to create. I'm going to crush <laughs> it. <laughs> Anyways. All right, All right, James, do some damage here. So, first thing I'm going to do is charge here. Now, in order to get the charge bonus, you have to move at least three inches. So we're gonna measure it out here, and in this case I'm moving four inches, because remember I moved it back four inches. Nice. So we charge up into here, into melee. Games are always more fun when you add your own sound effects. Oh yeah, and, and there's gonna be more sound effects to be had here. Oh yeah. All right, so my basher in this case, he's got a melee attack rating of six. Okay. Um, the uh, freebooter's defense is 12. Awesome. Well, I'm charging. So does that mean I get an automatic boosted attack? Yes, it is. Now it's interesting to note the wording. Boosting and adding a die are two totally different things. So if an attack is boosted and I have some other special ability that allows me to add another die, I can actually run with and roll four dice. However, if attack is already boosted and your ability says boost the die, you only ever get one boosted die. You can only ever have three dice in that, that instance. So in this case, I'm gonna roll right, to so attack. It took you a focus to charge. Yep, took me a focus to charge. In that case, would have been a hit. Okay. All right, so now I'm gonna use this focus to boost the damage roll. Okay, the however, Freebooter's armor is 17. However, I'm actually going to make that, what I should have done is, is call out the Grand Slam. It's his special ability here. I keep forgetting we're doing that part now. Um, this model can make a power attack slams without spending focus or being forced. Models slammed by this model are moved an additional two inches. Now, a slam attack is going to push back the model possibly into other models. If there's some smaller base models behind it, it could knock them down, do some damage to them. I could slam him far enough potentially to hit the wall and do some damage to him there. So there, there's some real good potential there to, to do additional damage, collateral damage, as well as just being annoying. <laughs> so we'll do the slam. Let's say I did the slam attack there. We'll do the damage here. 
In this case, the damage is 15, 23. Total. 23, so my armor was 17. Okay. So it looks like we're getting five damage past my armor. Five damage, and that's gonna go on to number two. All right, so I would fill this out. Um, I would put the five damage in the number two column. Yep. Then we have to do the slam actual pushing part of it, which is <laughs> 1d6 yep. plus, in this case, plus two. So he's going six inches. So he is definitely getting slammed into this house. And you can just imagine, if you read the fluff behind War Machine, these jacks weigh like, what is it, like five or six tons? Yeah, they're... I mean, they're massive heavy things. So you can just imagine this thing like being slammed back into a building and like half the building collapsing. It'd be awesome. Give me just one second here. All right, so I slammed him back, pushed him back. Now normally what happens is the model gets knocked down. However, his model has a special ability basically that makes him immune to being knocked down similar to the spell I cast in the beginning where my models can't be knocked down. So that part doesn't happen. The other thing too that can happen here, in this case, he's a larger based model. So he's not gonna suffer any collateral damage from that. Now, normally this would be done and over with. The model would be knocked down, my guy would be great. I slammed him, pushed him away, kept him away from my caster, all those goodies. However, the basher here has a really cool thing. He's got a called, what's called follow up. When this model slams an enemy model, immediately after the slam is resolved, this model can advance directly towards the slammed model up to the distance the slammed model was moved. So I get to move right back in base-to-base -base contact. Now, as part of that, that's a movement, he's going to do what's called a flak field. He's got a special ability, he's got these little grenade launchers here, and he gets to go poof. So this would set down here. That's obviously going to hit him. Now, flak field, flak field can be used once per turn, any time during its activation, but cannot interrupt its normal movement to do so. This model uses flak field. Models base to base with it suffer an unboostable power 12 blast damage roll, and other models within two inches of it suffer an unboostable power 6 blast damage roll. Hang on. My pocket's ringing. It's Joseph. Hello, Joseph. <laughs> And he's not talking to me. Ooh, he butt dialed you. Oh, there he is. Hey, Joseph, you're on camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and he's breaking up on me, so I can't hear him. So I guess he's going to have to text me if he can hear me. And of course, as soon as I go to hang up, he, I can hear him. <laughs> Fun interruption. All right, so unboostable power 12 damage roll. So in that case, it would be 20. What All was right. your armor? 17. So it's two more points of damage that would go on the, in that case, I would call that a cock die. We'd reroll it as a five. Oh, look at that, you got a five anyway. So I would put two damage points on my number five column. Awesome. So that would be his activation. Next activation over here would be the charge over here. Now we previously determined this is one inch or less, so it's not going to affect that. However, we do need to make sure that he's in range. The avalanche has a movement of speed of four. What is the charge distance Plus adding? three. Only three. So I've got plenty of room there. I'm actually only six inches away, so uh -huh. we are good to go. So we're gonna charge. Now, it's important to note too that you don't have to go for the center of the base. As long as you're in base contact with it, you're good. So I'm actually gonna come out over here and then kind of turn in there. And that uses his one focus for the charge. Charge is boosted. What is your defense on all right, Bose and Grog Spar's defense is 13. Awesome. My map is six. Definitely a hit. Nice. Okay, and damage. Okay, armor 15. Okay, my power plus strength is 14. Ooh. Wow. wow. Nice. So, in that case, he suffered 10 points of damage. So, if we look over here, we're gonna look down here, and you're gonna notice this little thing right here. This is how many life points the bosun has. And uh, so he actually has eight life points. So 10, ten points damage, kills this guy's dead. So you can either envision that the claw came up and punched him or he Poor got guy. drilled. This guy's so cool and he's dead now. Now he's a pile of blue goo. Yes. So that's All unfortunate. Right. And last but not least, we have the avalanche over here. Now you notice I didn't put any focus on him. So all he's gonna be able to do is shoot. Previously, 
this he had uh, Phantasm. Phantasm cast on him, so I really I'm outside the 10 inch range, so I don't want to shoot there. But I am going to shoot over here at the cannon. But I'm not shooting at the cannon itself because the cannon's really hard to kill. It's much better to kill the guys around it than the cannon's useless. Because the cannon can only fire if the crew is in base to base contact with it. Right. So we're actually going to take a shot right here. Alrighty. Okay, so let's measure the range there. Make sure that we are in range. In that case, I am at 12 inches. And your max range is 15, so max we're good. Max range is 15. So, in this case, Rat is 5. What is his defense? Alright, the uh, Commodore crew's defense is. 13. 13, all right, mm -hmm. this is a blast weapon. So let's first roll the hit. I think that's a hit. That's a hit. That's a dead on hit. It's a three inch blast, so it's gonna affect him and the cannon itself. Okay, but the other two guys are not caught in the blast. Right, all so right. he's taking a direct hit at full power, which is power 14. All right, my armor is 12, so he automatically hits. Okay. My, this guy is toast, yep. like. He's only got a single wound, so basically the model's just immediately left. removed. Yeah. Most now, infantry models will only ever have a single wound. Correct. Now, how about the cannon? What All does right. the cannon have for defense? Armor armor? Has, the uh, cannon has armor 18. Wow. And it has 10 damage boxes. Okay, now it's armor 18. My power was 14, but that's halved to 7. Because it wasn't a direct attack on the actual cannon itself. Correct. It's just in the blast radius. Yeah. So in that case... Nine, I'm only at 15, not enough to even do damage to it. Now, technically, the, the next turn the Commodore could still fire, because I still have crew members in there, um, but I'll actually take a penalty to my rat, yep. because I'm missing a crew member. Awesome. All right, so this is kind of the aftermath here of what just happened. Brett and I will actually do a full battle report probably next week for you guys. Um, but in the meantime, uh, do some research, and what should they be looking for? All right, so I'm going to show you the different factions that are available for War Machines. A war Machine. Um, so this is from the War Machine Prime rulebook. Uh, it has this nice little map here. So there's different, there's four major, um, they're called the Iron Kingdoms. Okay. Uh, so we have Kador, Signar, Protectorate of Minoth, and the Retribution of Syrah. Those are kind of the, the four major factions. Then, like what we've been playing here, we've been playing mercenaries, and mercenaries actually have their own book. Okay. Da, da, da. And mercenaries, it's important to note, actually has multiple army lists in one book. Yeah. So another, another interesting thing to note, certain mercenary models can actually be taken with like a, a Kador list or a Signar list or a Retribution list. And it'll say on the specific card, um, like for example, this one here, uh, my press gangers here, it says these models will work for Crix, Signar, Kador, and the Protectorate. And that's another one I forgot. I forgot about the Crix. So where are the Crix at? Um, yeah, let me get the, the book back. Sorry, the Crix are this little island chain right down here. Okay. Um, and so, for example, in the, the mercenary stuff here, we have the Rulik stuff. We have my guys, which are the pirate stuff, like they're, they're the, the privateer. The privateers. Yep. And there's actually two other factions in there as well that you can play. Um, and they, they kind of pull model types from all different, the different uh, main factions. Okay. Um, so, do your, little re do your research. Again, for all the major... The Signar Retribution, or sorry, Signar, Kador, Crix, and uh, Protectorate, you can get starter boxes for all of those. Like James said earlier, they, yep. they run about 15 points each. Um, and um, send your inquiries into us. We, we do a full assembly and painting on all War Machine and Hordes uh, projects. And um, yeah. And James, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Sure, give me one second. All right. All right, so we talked about kind of some of the different factions that are available, but each faction plays very differently. And each Warcaster in each faction plays very differently. For example, I'm running the Mercenaries over here, and we have two totally different forces based on who I'm taking. In this case, I'm running Gorton Grunbeck here, and my guys are kind of low defense, but really high armor. They, they're basically stout, short dwarves. The privateers over there, the, the pirates, they're a little bit less defense, a little bit less armor, but they've got more tricks up their sleeve. Uh, Cricks, for example, um, they're really kind of low defense, low armor, but they've got lots of tricks. If, they're, if you want a finesse army, if you want something that can really mess with your opponent, Cricks is the way to go. Kador, on the other hand, is a lot like the dwarves. They've got low defense, but super high armor, and they're really hard to just take down. They got battle mechanics, They've got all kinds of awesome units that, that really work well together. And Kador doesn't have a light warjack. Instead, they have what's called a man of war. 
They're basically guys in Terminator armor. For those of you <laughs> familiar with the 40K universe, that's basically what they look like. They're steampunk Terminators. They're amazing. Go check them out. Signar, on the other hand, Signar is uh, more of a kind of a shooty type of army depending on which way you run. But they're built to be able to, to shoot you from a distance, weaken you, and then slaughter you in close combat. Again, they're kind of mediocre when it comes to defense and armor. Protectorate of Minoth, same kind of thing. They're, they're kind of middle of the ground. They're not too powerful in any one aspect. But they've got lots of cool little special rules with flaming attacks and, and different things. In fact, you know, the, the Protectorate's a good army to start. It's a good starting army. Oh yeah, they're, they're, Their rules aren't super complicated. They're pretty straightforward. Yeah, good good army to start with. Oh, for sure. And last but not least is... The Retribution. Yeah, that's Brett's favorite, so I'm not even going to talk about that. <laughs> I'm going to let him talk about that one. All right. So the Retribution's a fun one, and, and James is going to be mad at me for saying this, but they're elves. And yes, I like the elves. He's a pansy. Um, yeah. But they're a lot of fun, because they're not your typical, like, pansy elves. No, they, they're not. Uh, they're not. I, the, the list I want to run is basically like these massively armored guys with massively armored warjacks that do a lot of damage, and uh, they're great. They're they're kind of a finesse army as well. They've got lots of tricks. You really have to balance your armies with the casters, um, otherwise they're not going to do a lot. But if you can get a good balanced army, they can. You can have a lot of fun with them. Yep, and Retribution has some pretty cool tricks that a lot of the other warjacks don't have and that they can have shields Yeah, on so them. There's, there's a slight difference. Between, um, the Retribution actually don't have warjacks. They have what are called Myrmidons. And so the, the typical steampunk warjack uses a big furnace and, you know, typical steampunk stuff. The Myrmidons for Retribution are actually powered by magic instead of mechanical features. Um, and they can, a lot of their uh, war, or Myrmidons can actually generate force fields. And so they can soak up damage into their force fields before taking it onto their actual frame itself. Um, and certain ones even have special rules where you can regenerate shields. So yep. they're fun. They're That's awesome. Fun. So anything else before we close? Nope. Um, contact us at bluetablepainting.com uh, if you have any questions. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. For sure. Look forward to hearing from you guys. See you guys.